Good morning, friends. Good morning. Make your way to your seats, please, as we get our service going this morning. A few announcements today is uh, we've got a members meeting after. As you can see, we're going to have a potluck. If you're a guest, you are welcome to stay to that. And if you're a member, please, please stay. And uh, we're going to be sending off JT in our members meeting. We're going to be welcoming, welcoming new members, so we have lots to do. Uh, also, we've got the 4th of July parade this week. A normal Sandabelle thing? Okay. I haven't experienced that yet. And uh, that's all we have by way of announcements. And before we get our service going, we're going to take a moment to greet your neighbor. friends, would you return to your seats as we get ready for the call to worship? Return to your seats, please. All right, everyone, please return to your seats and stand for the call to worship. The call to worship this morning is from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. Would you read with me? As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who has called you holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Would you bow your head with me? Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you this morning, thankful that we are called your children thankful that we can be obedient children by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would, you would fill us this morning as we worship you. We worship you in spirit and in truth. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's sing out together the battle hymn of the Republic.
is worthy. You may take your seat. At this time, I want to invite the ushers forward for this morning t- morning's tithes and offerings. And I also wanted to read some scripture before we go into prayer. This is from Revelation chapter 7. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels who were standing around the throne, around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? Our Father in heaven, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you today bringing our voice with the elders, with those four living creatures, with those who will one day surround your throne, and we say salvation belongs to our God. Lord, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to you forever and ever. Amen. Lord, we come only in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, all we have is Christ. Looking forward to that day when we're before your throne. Happy, joyful, no stain of sin, no stain of sickness or death anymore. And Lord, all we have is Christ. And we thank you for that. In your name I pray. Amen.
may be seated. I want to invite Brody, Brody Burns to the stage, and uh, we're going to turn in worship now to hearing God's word. And uh, we're going to read Proverbs chapter 5, and if you're using the Pew Bible, that is on page 497, page 497. Hello, Sanibel Community Church. My name is Brody Burns, and I'm honored to be reading your scripture for today. My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding, that you may keep discretion, and your lips may guard knowledge. For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander, and she does not know it. And now, O sons, listen to me, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless lest strangers take their fill of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life you groan when your flesh and body are consumed. And you say, how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. Drink water from your own cistern flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight, be intoxicated always in her love. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? For a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. Good morning, I'm Brad Thompson. I'm one of the elders here at Sanibel Community Church and it is my great privilege this morning to lead us in prayer. So would you pray with me, please? Good morning, Lord. Your church has gathered this morning to worship you, to sing praises to you, to petition you for our daily necessities, to repent and ask forgiveness from our sin and to seek your will for our lives. We thank you for your amazing grace and your endless love for us. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to walk among us, to teach us, and to take our sin upon himself, to die on the cross, and to rise three days later so that if we just believe in him, we might spend eternity with you. May your spirit be with each of us today to open our hearts and minds to your word so that we might grow to be more Christ-like. Father, we pray today for our members who can't be with us due to poor health or physical infirmities. We lift up Dan Dix, Al Chatfield, Marshall and Martha Wells, and many others. Comfort them and let them know that they are missed but they are not forgotten. Lord, we pray for the married couples in our congregation. We ask that you bless them and remind them of their commitment to each other and to you to hold their marriage vows sacred. Lord, we pray that your will for us to plant a church will come to fruition with Grace Fellowship at Babcock Ranch. Lift up Pastor Doug and his team there and our elders as we meet with the leaders at Babcock Ranch to explain our mission to them to spread the gospel to that community. Father, this week we celebrate the birth of our nation. 
As Sanibel continues its recovery from Ian, the 4th of July parade returns. As we at Sanibel Community Church pass out refreshments to participants and observers along the parade route, enable us to connect with some of those who might not know you. Help us to share a kind word or action and to invite those who are searching to join us in worshiping you. We pray for our leaders, Lord, our president, senators, congressmen, our governor, and our local leaders. Our hope is that they will fear you, revere you, and submit to your lordship. For your word says that that is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. We pray for the mission of Bridget and Dan Budd in Haiti, Lord. Uh, we pray that the violence in that country will be replaced by your peace and your love and that the Bud School Project might flourish. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of having gotten to know JT, and we bless him as he moves on to his next chapter which you have called him, to which you have called him. Lord, now we ask that you open our ears to hear and our minds to understand as Pastor Jeremy brings your word to us. Speak to us through Pastor Jeremy. Grant us wisdom to know your will for us and grant us the strength and perseverance to carry out that will. And all these things we ask in the precious name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Thanks, Brad. Well, we do invite any uh, kids here, uh, kindergarten through fifth grade, who'd like to go to Children's Church. You can uh, head to the back of the sanctuary, and uh, by the back exit, and we'll have our children's workers there to greet you. Uh, with the rest of you, open your Bibles again to Proverbs chapter 5, the text that Brody read for us earlier. Proverbs chapter 5, it's on page 497, if you're using a pew Bible. On those, those Bibles there, page 497, Proverbs chapter 5. If you're joining us for the first time this Sunday or you're in town visiting, welcome. Uh, we're studying through the book of Proverbs. And uh, today we come to uh, a needed chapter in our society and in our lives. Our society is fixated on, obsessed with, and absolutely saturated by sex. You didn't think you were going to hear that this Sunday morning, did you? <laughs> Sexual themes permeate advertising, music, and video games. Uh, good luck trying to find a TV show or movie or comedian that doesn't use explicit content. Um, Thanks to apps, there is uh, an easily accessible hookup culture in our society. Just swipe right and find that person. It's made so easy. Every day, there are millions and millions and millions of Google searches for pornography and explicit material online. In our culture today, sex is a huge big business. It is entertainment. Uh, in the hookup culture, it's kind of a sport or pastime activity. Um, it's become an enslavement and an addiction through online pornography. And it's become so deep that it's even become an identity. You know, people fundamentally today, many people identify themselves by their sexual preferences as if that's the most foundational thing to what a human being is. Um, if there was ever a society and a time that desperately needed God's wisdom and God's instruction on this topic, we are that society. And good news, here in Proverbs chapter 5, we got a whole chapter dedicated to it. In fact, this is a theme that you'll find throughout Proverbs, and, and the whole Bible speaks to this. This is what God has to say. And friends, we need to listen to what God has to say, because here's the thing. Guess who invented sex? God made it. He's the expert. It's all his idea. And in fact, it was God who made male and female. And what's the first command he gives them in the book of Genesis? 
be fruitful and multiply. So that gendered reality, male and female, in marriage, involving intimacy and producing children, is hardwired in to the very DNA and fabric of what it means to be human beings as God originally designed us. And so God has wisdom for us. And chapter 5 is just a great chapter that, that says so much that we need to hear on this topic today. So let's look at this chapter. It comes to us as much a Proverbs does as a father teaching his son, although obviously this is applicable to moms and to sisters and daughters as well. But that's the literary framework of Proverbs. It's, it's framed as a father teaching his son. And here the, the father wants to give wisdom on this topic of sexuality. And, uh, and, and he wants to really simplify it for us and give us two things. What to avoid and what to embrace. What, what good sex is and what bad sex is. Um, what is a red light and what is a green light? Or to use the language as we'll see here in Proverbs, it's the tale of two women. One to avoid and one to embrace. So look at Proverbs chapter 5, verse 1. He says, My son, be attentive to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may keep discretion and your lips may guard knowledge. So again, it's the father talking to his son, but this time they're having the talk. All right. This is a, a father who's willing to talk about these things with his son. Some of you had parents who, who, who had the talk with you about sexuality. Some of us found out about it other ways. Look, everyone's going to learn about it somehow and at some point. And it should come from your parents. That's who God's put in your life to teach you these things. And so here's, the, here's this dad teaching his, his son about this. And in, in verses 3 through 14, he, he's, he starts with the negative. He starts what to avoid. How, how sexuality is not to be used or expressed. And look what he says in verse 3. He says, for the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey. And her speech is smoother than oil. So the danger he wants to uh, warn his son against is the forbidden woman. Okay, wh what, what are we talking about here? Who's the forbidden woman? I mean, who is that? Uh, well, the, the word in Hebrew for forbidden is, could be translated strange. Not strange in the sense of like, that guy's weird. Uh, but strange in the sense of like a stranger. Somebody who's who's not in a relationship with you that, that you're separated from. Uh, it's, it's somebody who stands apart. Uh, if you look at verse 20, here, there it is again. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden or strange woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? Ah, here we go. And so the, the, the foreign woman or the strange woman to the son is the woman that he's not married to, <laughs> you know. So who, who is the forbidden woman? It's any woman that you're not married to, right? And flip it around for the ladies. Who's the forbidden man? It's any man that you're not married to. This is the pervasive biblical understanding of sexuality is that it's fundamentally for marriage. And so, so all forms of sexual sin, they're just different variations on a theme, which is sex outside of the bonds of a male-female marriage. And so the Bible talks about adultery. That's certainly in view here. Prostitution, hooking up, swinging, sleeping with your girlfriend, boyfriend, moving in together, homosexual sex, pornography, all of these are variations on the theme of the forbidden woman or, for, if you're a sister, a forbidden man. And, and I think we can read that here. Again, the framework is of a dad talking to his son, but it applies to men and to women. And so he, he wants to warn his son against that. But it's not just that, that it's someone you're not married to. The person in view here is also an enticing person. Look again at verse 3. The lips of a forbidden woman drip honey. And her speech is smoother than oil. And so the picture here is, is of that person, not just who you're not married to, but who's also seductive or enticing. Interestingly, it talks about the lips dripping honey. Isn't that interesting? You know, we think of sex being the, the body, but actually it's, it starts with speech. 
You know, people, people who have an affair, they don't just suddenly have an affair randomly. It usually starts with words. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. You get to know someone, and you're like, oh, wow, that was easy to talk to that person. There's a little spark. There's some chemistry. And then you talk a little bit more, and, and over time begin to share feelings and, and, and share personal things with one another. And then comes that day when it's like, you know, I wish I could talk to my spouse the way I talk to you. Oh, I feel the same way. And now the words are leading down a path. It, it, it all starts with the words. There's almost always an emotional affair that precedes an actual affair. And so there's a warning here of that smooth talk, uh, that, that language. And, and again, it can go both ways. Um, I'll never, ever forget uh, uh, when I was a young pastor. I was pastoring in Massachusetts, and I had a, a pastor friend uh, in the next state over. And uh, he was a young guy, and we're all trying to stay connected because, you know, trying to find good pastors in New England is a tr- can be a tricky thing. So anyway, uh, so we were connected, a couple of buddies. And then we found out one day, he, he said, hey, I just want you to know I'm, I'm leaving the church and leaving the ministry. We're like, why? What happened? He, he said, well, I, I had an affair. And so my buddy and I dropped, jumped in the car. We drove out to visit him. And there he told us in lurid detail the story over breakfast of, of how he got wound up in this affair. And I mean, it's like I couldn't even eat my food. I was just sick to my stomach listening to it. But you know how it all started? One day in church after the service, he was in the foyer, and a, a lady in the church came by, and she said, you know, if we were speaking in Spanish, I would call you El Guapo. And if you know Spanish, which I don't, it just means handsome guy. And, of course, he heard that, and then he had to look it up. And, and, you know, that was the hook. That was the hook. And that thought was lodged in his mind. And so it began a, a process of going from the speech to an actual affair. And, and it ruined his ministry. And he had to step out of ministry and, and just try to save his marriage and his, his life. And so that's where it, it begins. And it starts sweet, and it starts smooth, verse 3. But eventually you find out that it's not sweet, verse 4. It's bitter, and it's not smooth. It's sharp as a two-edged sword. And it leads to death, verses 5 through 7, uh, 5 to 6. Her feet go down to death. I mean, it's the path of death and destruction to go that way. And so the dad wants to drive this home. He's like, son, you got to think about this. Uh, you, you know, one of the problems with sexual temptation is that it's right here and it's immediate and it's all-consuming. And it's really hard to remember the long-term consequences of, of what it can lead to because you just get caught up in the moment. But it's like, no, 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 think about where this path will lead you. Verse 7, now, my sons, listen to me. Do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house, lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless. Son, you're going to lose your honor. Your years are going to be consumed without mercy. Don't get to that place in your life where you look back at your years and say, oh, my years were consumed and wasted. All of that time I could have been following the Lord and serving him and Satan took me out. With, with my addiction. Or, you know, I, I could have had this happy marriage. All those years I could have been enjoying the wife God gave me. And I ruined it. And I, I took it out. And now my, those years are gone. And you can never get them back. Verse 10. Let strangers take their fill of your strength. And your labors go to the house of a foreigner. You know, in those days, if, if you had an affair with some other guy's wife, I mean... Well, under Old Testament law, he could have you killed. And if he didn't, he could take whatever he wanted. You were really at his mercy. And even today, you know, sexual sin and infidelity, it, it leads to broken marriages. And it can suck, sap your strength and your money. I mean, alimony, child support, divorce settlements. Divorce is generally financially ruinous and negative to everybody involved. I mean, it's, it's not a way to like, you know, get ahead financially in life. And, and so there's a, a major uh, warning there about that. 
about the impact that it has on, on your family, on the impact it has on your, your spouse and the kids and the grandkids. It, it has a generational ripple effect. And so he wants to warn his son, don't just get caught up in the moment. Have the long-term view of where this leads. And then the regret. I mean, the, the regret in verses 11 to 14 is just palpable. He says, at the end of your life, you groan when your flesh and body are consumed. And you say, how I hated discipline and my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I'm at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation to finally be at the end of the road and just be like, why didn't I listen? Why did I make these choices? I'm, I'm at the brink of ruin and humiliation publicly. Again, I'll never forget after we had breakfast with our pastor friend, and then we, he said, hey, could you guys just come back to the house? And we're like, oh, okay. So he drove back to his house, and, and he took us into his uh, sort of living room area, and, and he had a, a bookshelf built into the wall, and it was just full of his seminary books. And he said, hey, you guys, I just want you to take these books and do with them whatever you want. And we're like, Dude, we, we don't feel good about doing this. <laughs> it felt like someone had died and we were giving up their possessions. And he's like, just take them. He goes, I'm not going to use these. And so, I don't know, we took a few just because we felt like he asked us to, but neither of us wanted to take any of his books. But, you know, you just think of the symbolism, what those books were. I mean, this is like years and thousands of dollars of study and preparation for ministry and pouring out yourself into that. And now just to have it all gone, you know, so wasted. And, you know, the regret that he had is, as he's publicly humiliated before the congregation, literally in his case, man. And so we want to be warned about this. So what should we do in the face of sexual temptation and sexual sin? What should we do when, when, when we see that coming our way? Well, we're told here what we should do, and I'll just sum it up for you in one word. Flee. Flee. Run for your life is the only rational reaction to sexual temptation. Look at verse 7. And now, my sons, listen to me. Do not depart from the words of my mouth Keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. Just as far away as you can stay. You have to run for it. You know, in, in war, you've got to know when to stand and fight and you've got to know when to retreat and run. And, and in the battle against sin, in this case, you always flee. You can't manage this. You, 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 can't, you can't control this. This is not something to be flirted with. It's to just run for your life. It's like you're standing there fishing and you see an alligator swimming toward you. Like, you flee. <laughs> you just run. <laughs> you don't sit there and be like, oh, I wonder what he wants. You know, like, maybe this will be neat. Like, no. You're going to die. Run. You flee. You, you stay far away from it. It's not the kind of thing that you can keep under control. It, it, it's a runaway sort of situation. Look what Jesus said. Take out your, uh, I, in the bulletin, if you look in there, I put in some sermon, uh, some other scriptures. Look on pages five and six. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter five, verses 27 to 30. It's on page five. Jesus said, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. He says, but I say to you, and he just goes way more intense. He says that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You know, it starts in the heart. It starts in the mind before it gets to the actions. And then get this, verse 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. Verse 30, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go to hell. And you're like, wow, Jesus, that was super intense. Like, why, why did he say that? What's the point? In other words, the point is, whatever it takes, you do it. You take radical 
action against sin. And interestingly, he puts this right in the context of what? Sexual temptation. Because you just got to cut it out. Make, give it no quarter. Give it no space in your life. It's not something to be managed. It's something to be uh, cut off and thrown away. Or look at what Paul says. Just look over at the next page. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 to 20. Flee from sexual immorality. That's it. <laughs> Flee. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You know, if, if you're a Christian, Jesus has total ownership, not just of your soul and your heart, but of your body as well. And so we surrender our, our bodies to Christ. Jesus died to save our souls. And someday he's going to raise us from the dead. And he died to save our bodies too and to give us a new body. We belong to Christ, body and soul. And so we, we, we have to flee from these temptations because they're, they, they're a sin against your own body. And so flee, run. As you're here this morning, let me just ask you, are, are you living near the door of the forbidden woman? Are you hanging around the neighborhood of the forbidden man? If you're married, are you drifting away from your spouse? Have you begun a, an emotional connection with someone else? Are, do you find yourself fantasizing about somebody other than your spouse? Uh, if you're unmarried, are you living a chaste life? Are you learning to be in control of your body? Are you hooked on and addicted to pornography? My friend, Whatever it takes, flee, cut it off, and live. <laughs> Don't die. Because it's the path of death. And so whatever it takes, maybe, heck, maybe right now, you just in the middle of this sermon, you just got to stop listening, get your phone out, and start deleting some things. <laughs> Do it. You know, maybe right after this, you need to leave here, call someone, and cut off a relationship forever that's tempting you. Do it. Whatever it takes. This is life and death. Black and white. Gray is black. And it will destroy you. And so run for your life. Have pity on your own soul. In fact, look at what it says in 1 Corinthians 6 a little bit earlier. Look back at your sermon notes. This is super intense. Look at verse 5. I'm sorry, page 5, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Paul says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. If, if those things are marking your life as, as to who you are and how you live, and you're like, oh, it's okay, I know I'm going to heaven, you need to think twice. You might not be. Because these things don't mark the life of somebody who, not again that Christians don't struggle, do Christians struggle with sin? Yeah, but Christians always repent. <laughs> That's the difference. Christians are like, oh my goodness, Lord, forgive me. But if these things mark your life in an unrepentant way, you have no confidence, I'm telling you, to think that you're going to heaven. You need to repent of these things. And so, so do I. I need to have none of these things in my life. But it's not just what you flee from, friends. It's what you flee to. And you've got to flee to the only one place that's safe. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ Verse 11 is so good. So such a harsh, scary language in verses 9 and 10. Look how verse 11 then stops. Paul says, and such were some of you. So he's talking to his church about people who used to be those things. He says, but you were what? Washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Praise God that Jesus Christ died on the cross and shed his blood to cleanse sexual sinners. 
Hallelujah. That Jesus' blood can wash any unrighteousness. It doesn't matter if you've got a past that you're so embarrassed of. If you will run to Christ and put your faith in him, he'll wash you. And he can transform you. The same Jesus who died is the same Jesus who rose. And so that means he has a life-giving, transforming power. You know, it's not just, oh, I sin and I just ask for forgiveness and then I'm back to the old routine. There's power in God to live a new and holy life. It's not in you, but it's in Christ. And the Holy Spirit can change you from the inside out. God has cleansing power on the cross, transforming power through the resurrection of Jesus and his Holy Spirit. And so, my friend, flee to Christ. Flee away from sin and flee to Jesus. And remember, God sees it all. Going back to Proverbs 5, verse 20. One, what for a man's ways are before the Lord. No one else may see and know, but God sees, sees it all. And so flee to Christ. If you've never run to Christ, if you've never put your faith in him, you know, again, if you have to delete something today, delete it. But I don't know whether or not you have to do that, but everybody run to Christ today before you get home. <laughs> Call upon the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So then what's the alternative? So dad has warned us against how, how to ruin our lives through sex, which is the forbidden woman. Uh, so, so what do you do instead? Well, what's the proper and good and life-giving expression of our sexuality? And we find that in verses 15 to 19. It's, it's to embrace your spouse. Look at verses 15 to 19. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely doe, a graceful deer. Let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. So we shift gears from a very stern warning to a, a, just a beautiful invitation for the son to love his wife. I mean, verses, you know, 15 and 19, they're downright steamy. Bet you didn't know this stuff was in the Bible. <laughs> but again, you know, sometimes I think we get this idea that, that the biblical view of sex is puritanical and it's, um, you know, stuffy and it's prudish and nothing can be further from the truth. I mean, this is a very positive view of sexuality, but it's directed to your spouse. That's how God designed it. Let's look at those images in verses 15 and 19. Two things I want to say about them. The first is that they communicate exclusivity of relationship. Again, look at verses 15 to 17. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets? Obvious answer, no. Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. And so it's, a, it's an exclusive relationship with no one coming into that. It needs to be guarded. Uh, you know, you think about this water imagery and, uh, you know, here's, he's writing to ancient agrarian people in an arid environment where water is life. And so you guard the water. If you have a well, like, and that's your clan's well, like you fight to the death to protect the well because that's life, right? You don't just, it's not just say, hey, everyone, come and drink from our cistern. Like, no, this is what's going to keep our family alive. And so there's a call here to guard and protect the exclusivity of the relationship. No, nothing can get in there or, or come between them, uh, you and your spouse. There's a, an exclusivity to, to a husband's and wife relationship. We say that in our wedding vows, you know, that, that you alone are the one to whom I commit my life when we get married. But it's not just the exclusivity of the relationship. It's also, and I think this is really comes out in verses 15 to 19, maybe surprisingly slow. Uh, so, is the enjoyment of the relationship. I mean, look at the positive, beautiful way that the father describes sexual intimacy between a husband and a wife. Uh, first of all, he calls it water. You know, what's water? It's refreshing. It's life-giving. You know, think of yourself on a hot day and 
you're out doing things in the yard and you come in and you're grimy and you're overheated and you just get a big tall glass of water or iced tea and you know the it's sweating on the outside of the cup and you just you know and the the tea is dripping down your face you're like ah you know you put it against your head like oh that was just what i needed and that's the imagery that it's it's a, a satisfying imagery it's like water but it gets even more intense than that look at down at verse 18 let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. And so men, if, if you're married, God commands you to rejoice in the wife of your youth. That's a command. And you're like, well, she's not, she's not a youth anymore. <laughs> it's not what it says. <laughs> it doesn't say rejoice in a youthful wife. It says rejoice in the wife of... My youth. In other words, the, the, the woman I married. And so it's rejoicing in her and delighting in her and just being captivated by her. Um, you know, she's a lovely do- a deer, a graceful doe. You guys have all had a, an encounter, right, where you suddenly found yourself in close proximity to a deer? We've all had that, right? You know, you just walk in and suddenly one's there. And what do you do? And you just stand there and you watch it. You can't stop looking at it. You're like, ah. Oh. You know, you get, that's the image. It's this, it's this guy who's like, wow, wow. And, and I just want to tell you, you can cultivate and guard a sense of wow with your spouse your whole life. You know, it's, it's something you, it, you, could, you make a choice to do it. And it's something you can maintain and sustain. I've been married to Jennifer 30 years. I'm still super into her, <laughs> to use modern language. She's still wow to me. I just, just so much I enjoy about her. We were on a family vacation recently, and uh, uh, we um, had the whole family together. Of course, we love having the whole, you know, I'm getting old. I'm like, why can't the whole family just be together? Had all our kids there. One of the things I love about having a whole family together, besides having all the kids, is I just like watching my wife transform. Just how much fun she has, how freed and relaxed she is when all of her kids are around. Man, I just delight in that. I'm just like, wow. It's just fascinating to me. She, she's, she fascinates me. And, but, you know, I, I realize that that's a decision to remain fascinated. You will be delighting in and fascinated by whatever you keep putting in front of your face. You are not a slave to your desires as a Christian. You can actually steer and cultivate your desires by whatever you, whatever you feed in is what you'll be fascinated by. And so we can do that. We can make a choice. That's something that, that, the, that, that by God's help, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can delight in, in our spouses. Verse 19, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Like I said, this is steamy stuff. You know, but this, is, this is God's view of the, the joy and the goodness and the beauty of sex within the, the commitment of a married relationship. And then it gets even more intense. <laughs> Verse 19, be intoxicated always in her love. He's like, son, here's God's command to you. Be drunk on your wife. Just be intoxicated with her. You know, how do people act when they're intoxicated? Well, you know, they, they act stupid. They, they lose their inhibitions. They, they just say dumb things. They act dumb. It's embarrassing. You know, but this is, this is the beauty of marriage is to be intoxicated. And the great thing about being intoxicated with your spouse is that when you wake up in the morning, there isn't a hangover of regret and shame. It's like, it's great. There's no regret, you know? It's not like when you have a one-night stand, and then you wake up, and you just feel so slimy. You're like, what was I doing? What was I thinking? I feel so empty. Why did I do that? There's none of that. There's no fear with your spouse. You don't have to worry about diseases, right? You don't have to worry about pregnancy, 
Did we get pregnant? What happened? You know, because it's like, hooray, we got pregnant. (laughs) That's what's supposed to happen. Be fruitful and multiply. It's ultimately about, you know, not just the, the joy of marriage, but then making new people made in God's image so that they can know the Lord and then be raised up in a godly family. This is, the, this is how God designed humanity to function. And so it, it's a beautiful thing that God has here for us. There's no, there's no fear. There's no regret. It's just learning to delight yourself and your spouse more and more. So rather than thinking of, I don't know, the Christian view of sex as puritanical or prudish or anything like that, I actually think it's, it's a glorious view of sex. See, I, I think sometimes we think, oh, the Bible's down on it, but the culture is really free and open with it. And I, want, I just want to say I think it's exactly the opposite. I think the problem with our society today is it has too low and mean view of sexuality, that it's just sort of a physical activity for just getting my jollies for a little bit. And then you just do, it's kind of like an activity or a sport or an addiction. Like, really? But the Bible says, no, 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 no. It's sacred. It's a sacred gift. And in fact, sex is meant to point, it's not an end in itself. It actually is a kind of parable or dramatization of something even more beautiful than itself, which is the marriage between a husband and a wife. Just one, one more text, if you look at your uh, handout, uh, page 5, Genesis 2, 21 to 24. This is the very first sex scene in the Bible. The very first marriage in the Bible. Very first marriage ceremony and honeymoon. Genesis 2, 21 to 24. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Do you hear the delight? She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And therefore, this sets the pattern for all marriage. It says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And so marriage is a one flesh relationship. It's a, it's a fusing together till death do you part of two people who commit to covenant love with one another through better for worse, richer for poorer, sickness and health, forsaking all others, as long as we both shall live. It's that kind of relationship. And, and it's, it's a fusing of everything. It's a fusing of your lives. It's a fusing of your, um, uh, your future. You, you go all in together. It's a fusing of your, your finances. You know, it's just pastoral advice. I just advise every couple here not to have separate finances. It, it just leads you down such a bad path. Separate finances is a separate life. And it just sets up a temptation. So it's just pastoral counsel to you. But it's a one flesh relationship. So that physical intimacy is a dramatization and a picture of the coming together of shared life in marriage. It's, it's just a beautiful picture of it. So, so really what's at stake is, is when we express sexuality outside the bonds of marriage, we're actually kind of telling lies with our bodies. And it's, it's describing a coming together in a union that isn't in reality between the two people involved. That's a sacred view of sexuality. In fact, it's even higher than that. Because if sex is a parable of marriage, marriage isn't even the end in itself. It's a parable of what? Christ and the church. That the husband loves his wife as Christ loved the church. And the wife submits to her husband and honors him. And together, that that loving relationship between husband and wife is meant to be a picture of the kind of love and intimacy that God has with his people. So sex points to marriage, and marriage points to God's relationship with us. Isn't that beautiful? That that the kind of relationship God wants to have with us is like a devoted, unbreakable, exclusive relationship, and that God wants us to know him deeply, even as a husband and wife are meant to know each other. 
that, that God wants us to, to savor and delight in him, that we can know Christ that way. Isn't that awesome? And so really, even just the sex is not the end of itself. Marriage is not the end of itself. It's really about knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's good news, especially if, if you're not married for whatever reason. Or maybe you are married and, and you know, your spouse is really sick or something. You just you kind of have to live together as roommates for difficult reasons. And, and you think, ah, oh, you know, you know what, what if you're like, I don't have this outlet in verses 15 to 19. And, and I just want to say, yeah, that's hard. But listen, you can live a full, happy, joyful life without sex. But you cannot live a full joyful and happy life without Jesus Christ. He is infinitely better than sex. And everything is worth Christ and laying hold of him. Like we sang, all I have is Christ. And if you have Christ, you have everything, even if you don't have a spouse. And if you're married and you don't have Christ, my friend, you have nothing. You are bankrupt. And so ultimately, it's, it's good news you know, there is coming, a, do you guys know there's coming a day when there'll be no more sex in the universe? In the new heavens and the new earth, Jesus says we will not be married nor given to marriage because we'll already be in a marriage, which will be us with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so even, even sex and marriage are temporary creations pointing us toward a greater reality. And so whether you're single or married or whatever your condition is, we all look forward to the great fulfillment of all things when we'll be with the Lord forever. So my friends, flee from sexual immorality. If you're married, cling to your wife and delight in her. In all of us, let us remember that Christ is worth it all. He's worth it all. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that, Lord, you're not afraid to talk to us about things that we really need to hear, that you love us so much. And God, we just pray that all of us would glorify and honor you, that, Lord, we would know Jesus, we would know his forgiveness and his transforming power, that we would know the delight and the satisfaction of being united to Christ through faith. Thank you, Lord, for, uh, I just pray for uh, married couples here, that they would be devoted to one another, that nothing would come into their marriage to lure them away. I pray, Lord, for every husband here, that he would delight in the wife of his youth, and every wife would delight in the husband of her youth. Lord, I pray for single brothers and sisters here today, uh, those who are widows and widowers, those who uh, have never been married. Lord, I just pray that, that they would find their contentment in Christ, and they would surrender their lives to you, that you would teach them how to be content in Jesus and to find him to be their all in all. And Lord, may we all just keep Christ uppermost in our affections. We know that our life is hidden with Christ in God, and that when Christ, who is our life, appears, we will appear with him in glory. Lord, bring that day soon, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, would you please stand as we sing our closing song. <laughs>
I just want to say thank you to JT. He's led us in worship faithfully for a number of weeks, and this is his last time. If you're new with us, we just want to welcome you. We've got a gift for you in the back, right in front of the sound booth. Come get to know us and, and get that gift. I want to invite the prayer team forward, too, and they can stand here in front of the stage. If you need prayer for anything at all, maybe, maybe this sermon... Uh, you realize there is something you're enslaved to. Maybe you need prayer for that. Come get prayed for. And then also, we, get, we have the members meeting directly following the service, so we need people to help move the chairs back and tables in. We're, we need 17 to 18 tables set up. So if you're able to help with that, please help with that. And now hear this blessing from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace.